All right. So where we were on on Wednesday was, you know, reductions of aldehydes and ketones, right, with uh, either sodium borohydride and methanol, or we could use, and I'm going to use the same one here because I want to show you something specific, right, but we could have substituted in either of these one lithium aluminum hydride, right, followed by uh, water. Right, so they're interchangeable right now with aldehydes and ketones. The thing that I wanted to express uh, first this morning was whenever you look at this, right, um, you get primary alcohols from aldehydes, right, but you always get secondary, secondary alcohols from ketones. So there were some questions about alcohol, uh, ketones, aldehydes and ketones can work the same. They're both the ox same oxidations level, right? If we think about oxidation level, so <clears throat> they work. The difference is the product. One is a primary versus a secondary, and we can add lithium aluminum hydride without uh, having any change in our, our reaction. Okay. If we look at uh, an extension of this, is reaction of uh, reduction of esters and carboxylic acids. Now for this one, if we take an ester, and react it with lithium aluminum hydride, We'll need, we'll need excess, we'll need one more than one. Sometimes you'll see them not show excess. And I'll explain that in a minute. But this will actually reduce that down to the alcohol. We can also do the same thing with an acid. All right, so lithium aluminum hydride. And we get the alcohol. So sodium borohydride, right, will not work. It's not a strong enough reagent to actually reduce the ester and the carbonyl, right? So in this case, the sodium borohydride is not interchangeable. Um, when we look at aldehydes and ketones, they are interchangeable with carboxylic acids and esters. You have to use a lithium aluminum hydride. So let's look at the mechanism on the ester and see what's going on. So we have our aluminum. So we get a hydride attack at the carbonyl carbon. Pi bond is the bond that breaks. That gives me my oxygen negative. We have our hydrogen, OCH3 here. Now at this point, if this had been a ketone uh, or an aldehyde, we would have stopped because there would have been nothing for, uh, there would be no good leaving groups um, to, to have this go forward, right? So, but here, if we think about it, this oxygen, right? If that left, Oxygen negatives, well, that's an oxygen negative, right? So there's there's not a big difference. If I break this bond here, homolytic, uh, heterolytically, right, I'm going to end up with an oxygen negative. If I had tried to do that with an aldehyde or a ketone, I would have ended up with a hydride, which I just added and is not very stable, or a carbon anion, which is not very stable, right? So we want to, uh, here we have a good leaving group, right? Or we have a leaving group. And that allows this to take this next step, which is the electrons coming down, kicking off the leaving group, resulting in reforming that carbonyl, right? Plus then um, our, 
OCH3 minus. So that group is an aldehyde. Will lithium with little lithium aluminum hydride react with that? Yes. All right. So then this. And so that comes in and attacks that. We end up with this. And then in the second step, right? Then we add our water to do a proton transfer. And that gives us our, our alcohol. Okay. So just like with the aldehydes and ketones, we get a hydride attack at the carbonyl. Pi bond breaks, right? Pi bond breaks. Then different, right? Is now we have either an OH or an OCH3, right? So if it had been an acid, we would add an OH. That's a, a good leaving group or a decent leaving group, right? So then for the negative electrons can come down, right? Reform that pi bond. This bond breaks. And if you think about the stability, we really are dealing with similar stabilities between these two oxygen negatives, but now we've created this pi bond, right? That, that can react with the hydride. The hydride comes in, breaks that pi bond, we end up with a negative, and then we get a proton transfer to finish out the process, okay? Now, when you look at these reactions, if I have, These are distinct, um, somewhat distinct in the fact that they're always going to give you the uh, primary. And we show it down like this, but the truth is it'd be the oxygen that's up, not the oxygen that's here. So if we color coded these, this can probably help. If that's my purple oxygen and this is my hot pink oxygen, right? It's actually my purple oxygen that stays, not my hot pink oxygen. Okay. But I do end up with a primary alcohol. All right, so reductions of carbonyl species, either aldehydes and ketones, or carboxylic acids and esters uh, can give us alcohols. Right, so let's move to diols. We already looked at some diols. Um, there is a, 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 the reason we call them diols is because of the nomenclature. Right, so if we look at this, this is three carbons. So this is gonna be propane. Now, if it only had one alcohol, we'd add an OL. But here we're going to put diol as our suffix, right? We add the E back in so that the N and the D aren't touching. So propane, there's no triple bond. So I use the A here and then diol. And I need to say where the diols are. And in this case, they're one and three. So this would be one, three propane diol. Now in really complex structures, we can move the one, three between the propane and the diol um, as you've seen us do in, in the past. So when you, if you get any nomenclature problems in the book around diols, um, the thing that I usually see people miss is just adding the E back in. And that has to do with English conventions about having two consonants uh, together. Um, if you're using an English alphabet, but you're not English, you'll see consonants backed up all the time. But of course, this naming system um, predominated out of, out of, uh, out of, Western European countries and not Eastern European countries. So, um, okay. Um, comparing these, we've seen these, right? So this is a review. We've seen both of the anti and the sin. So if we take and react this with, uh, you know, some type of peroxy acid, followed by acid and water. 
right? We're going to get the anti addition. Right, we've already seen that reaction. This is not new. And then if we take and react some type of osmine, you know, an osmine or permanganate, uh, here I'm going to use the catalytic form with the NMO. We've seen that before. All right, then we'll get the syn addition. And both of those are review, so creating diols. Uh, we can, uh, an extension of what we just learned, so I don't know if you call it new or not, if we have a dicarbonyl species and we reduce that with sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride and just use an excess, right, we can reduce a dicarbonyl species to a diol. Now, the difference with this one, notice that in the one that we learned previously, the diols are always what? They're always one and two, right? They're always one and two. But here, if we have a one and five species, right, we can end up with a one and five species here. So the previous additions across the double bond always added the one and two across the double bond. Um, but if we, we, can, we can make diols from carbonyls uh, by by doing uh, doing these types of reactions, right? So potentially we could have taken this compound, turned it into this compound, and then reduce that to. this compound. Okay. So uh, review, and then I would call this an extension of what we just learned, right? Not totally new because it's just a double reduction with the sodium borohydride, which we learned on Wednesday. All right, the next way of protection alcohols, we need to start with creation of a reagent. The Grignard reagent. What happens in the Grignard reagent is we can take a halide, react that with manganese, manganese the metal, in a non-protic solvent, it's most often ether. Ether actually stabilizes the reaction, so that's why we use it uh, most often. Um, right, and we can get this species. If we look at what's happening here, let's take uh, you know this bromide, react that with magnesium. We do get an insertion, right? So it's it's always where the bromine was attached. It's not a backside attack, this is the metal. We'll get the magnesium and kind of inserting itself between the carbon bromine bond. But what the big, big deal here is that if we look at our starting material, I have a dipole movement going in this direction. So I have a partially negative charge here and I have a partially positive charge at the carbon. If I look between magnesium and carbon, which is more electronegative, well, the carbon is more electronegative. So that means I will have a partial positive here and a partial negative there. So what we've done is we've inverted this carbon from being electrophilic to nucleophilic. And we can do this because it's an insertion. We can also do this with aromatics. In fact, it works very well with aromatics. You know, so here we can take our happy little uh, bromide, react that with magnesium and ether, and I don't know why I made a sad one, but then all is sad because now it's got magnesium stuck in his ear, right? So we can do this type of reaction. So 
Um, it works with uh, SP3 carbons. It works with SP2 carbons. Um, right. So, so the electronics of the carbon flip by churning the, the reagent. What I start with is an electrophilic group, meaning nucleophiles will react with that. What I end up with is a nucleophile, right? And that's where we start to use this is that we can use this as a nucleophile. Uh, Grignard additions. Two carbonyls. Right, so we can have, um, if we had a ketone, we could add a Grignard. And again, they're almost always in ether. And we can get an alcohol. We get an alcohol, plus we also what? We extend the car carbon skeleton. So this is an important reaction because we do, we maintain our functionality, right? We go from an, uh, an oxygen containing to an oxygen species. We change oxidation state, but we've also extended our carbon skeleton. So the mechanism on this one, we start with the carbonyl. The Grignard acts as a nucleophile. The pi bond is my leaving group, right? So since I have this change in polarity, right, that makes that carbon nucleophilic. That then creates the O minus, right? I've added two carbons and so that we can see those CH2, I'm gonna leave them as the, the condensed form, right? So that's the end of step one. And then step two, we add in our water, picks up this proton. So we're preparing an alcohol, but we're also extending the carbon structure, right? So we can add this to, to our toolbox of carbon, carbon changing reactions, right? So we had the acetylide that was really the only way to extend a carbon uh, chain at this point. So now we can add the Grignard reagent and you'll see the Grignard reagent used quite a bit and it's used quite a bit because it can extend uh, the carbon structure. Uh, there's not really any limit on the number of carbons you could add. Um, there is a potential limit from the standpoint of the fact that a Grignard, um, say that we take this Grignard and, oops, and we put it in an alcohol. Let's say that we were trying to have it react with this, right? Um, so because this is a good nucleophile, it also is a good base. And what would happen here is that you would end up with not the addition, but the deprotonation, right? So therefore we cannot have, right? This is gonna be sensitive to protons. So we can't have it any protic solvents, 
but also either the Grignard reagent, we can't make a Grignard reagent if it has an alcohol on it, and whatever we're reacting with, if it has an alcohol on it or an amine, um, we're going to have a problem because it's going to react with that first, right? So as far as structure, I could have a huge structure. Um, you know, I could have something. And I could add Mg. And the CHO is an abbreviation for carbonyl. And as long as there's not something that will, like a proton that will disrupt the reaction and do a proton transfer, I could have then the attack on the carbonyl. So you can get to incredibly big structures here. Um, so there is really no limit on the Grignard side of it other than you've got to watch for um, possible side reactions uh, of the proton. So we have Grignards, now we can have Grignard with esters. So we can't use carboxylic acid here because they have protons, but we can use esters. And with the ester, what happens? And ET is ethyl, right? So this is a two carbon species. Because it can add twice, All right? So sometimes you'll see adding excess here. Sometimes they won't uh, because it it will go ahead and go react. So if we look at the mechanism on this one, right, we have this. We've got our CH3, CH2, MGBR. This acts as a nucleophile, attacks that carbonyl carbon, pi bond breaks. That gives us the O minus. Like with the hydride, right? We now have uh, a good, a decent leaving group, right? Not a great leaving group, but a decent leaving group. No worse than the oxygen negative I have. That comes down and kicks off the oxygen. Reform that carbonyl, right? Then this can react with another equivalent. Right. So we end up with this species. And then the last step is proton transfer, right? We add in a proton source. Has to be in the last step because the Grinder's not stable with it. And that gets us to our final product. Okay. Questions about this mechanism? Okay, before we move on to the next step, let's do some, uh, try this.
Okay, let's take a little time, look at these three. In the first case, right here, the pH stands for uh, phenyl, right? So the uh, phenyl will be um, this group. Now, if you just wrote pH there, that's fine for right now, but it is important to understand the different structures, right? So the phenyl. Because we're going from an aldehyde to the to the uh, al alcohol, remember that this H here is really only shown to really help you understand that that's an aldehyde. Uh, the convention would not to be to show the extra hydrogen over here. The second one, we're adding um, two carbons, right? So we end up with this, right? Tertiary carbocation. Um, might as well go ahead and note here so we don't have to do it later. If we start with an aldehyde, we end up with a secondary alcohol, right? If we end up with, start with a ketone, we end up with a tertiary alcohol, right? And these are some of the things that'll help you when you're looking at retrosynthesis and such at the end of the chapter. Then the second one, we form the grignard, the grignard reacts with the ester, and then we do the protonation. So what we end up with is the alcohol, and two phenyl groups, right? Two of the aromatics, right? And this also gives a tertiary alcohol. Questions about these three? The next section is protection of alcohols. And we want to protect alcohols for, for two reasons. One, this OH may interfere, right, in a reaction. Right, but also we may want to have a reaction where we have something on one side of the reaction. Let me change this. Let's say that we have an aldehyde here, and you haven't seen this reaction yet, but, and we have an alcohol over here, and I want to change this to the carboxylic acid, which is gonna take an oxidation without changing this, right? So here I've done an oxidation, but here there's no change. So protecting groups can allow things to not interfere, right? So we're not gonna have a problem with that proton, or it could allow us to do something on one side of the molecule and not do something on the other side of the molecule. The example we'll use, and this is from your book, is let's say that we wanted to have this species that had a bromine on one side and an alcohol on the other. And our goal is to get to, you know, this species here, right? 
Well, we can think about that we would take that and we could turn that into the Grignard. Right, and then uh, the Grignard could have reacted with a carbonyl. And then, you know, water to get us to the final product. But we know that this won't occur, right? Because that proton will react with that. So we have a problem here that synthesis could work, but the problem is we have an alcohol. So we're gonna have a Grignard formed in a species where it has a proton, a, a, a acidic proton in the structure. So the question is how can we get all the way to the product? And the way we do this is that we are going to take the substrate going to protect and I'm gonna but the book does this so I'll do this so put a box here right we're going to change it into something else then we're going to react you know we're going to do all the reactions we want to Right? And then we're going to deprotect. So you can think about it chemically, what we're doing is we're hiding it. Right? We're changing the functional group into some other functional group that'll hide it. Then we're doing the reactions that we want to do, and then we're bringing it back. Right? So the things that, that are important for the protection and deprotection. Is it's got to be uh, doesn't have to be a simple reaction, but it has to be very straightforward. It has to have a high yield. But because by doing this, right, if the reaction only had a seventy percent yield, you'd have a problem. It it is good if it it is very specific, right? So in this case, it needs to be very specific for alcohols or OH groups, right? To to be very specific. And then the deprotonation needs to be very specific. Our deprotection has to be very specific. Meaning that my deprotection step isn't going to react with a bunch of different react, uh, react, reagents. Okay. And so what we're getting to, and we're going to see these as the chapters go on, is we're going to look at protecting and deprotecting groups for lots of our different uh, functional groups. Here, the protection group we're going to use is uh, a silane group. So if we take our alcohol, right, and I'm just using a generic alcohol, we can react that with TMSCL in pyridine, right? That is That's trimethylsilane chloride, right? That's TMSCL. What that creates is this protected alcohol. So what we've done now is we've created an oxygen to silane bond with the CH3s around here. So this is no longer just an alcohol, it's this oxygen silane species. So this is how we're hiding it, right? We're gonna hide it as this TMS species. It, you can think about it as an SN2 style reaction with pyridine picking up, um, and I'm sorry, the book uses triethylamine uh, instead of pyridine. Uh, both I've seen both used, but since the book uses this, I wanna stay with that. Uh, so this reaction goes somewhat through an SN2 style reaction to get us to the silane. Again, the reaction is only at the oxygen, so we don't have to worry about any uh, change in stereochemistry at the carbon. 
the bulkiness actually uh, helps a little bit with the silane. The, the si silicon compounds hydrolyze pretty easily. And so therefore any water around uh, is a little bit uh, problematic. So therefore the, the trimethylsilane is just more stable uh, than, than if we only had one carbon on there. It does hinder a little bit, um, but in most cases it doesn't hinder it enough to have a reaction occurring at the oxygen. And again, remember this is a protecting group. So it's not a bad thing if the extra bulkiness um, keeps it from, from doing reactions at this site. We're trying to protect this site. But the main reason for the trimethyls is actually that the silane groups hydrolyze really easily. It's the reason that the uh, Star Trek episode where they had the um, mother, mother Hydra, I think it was called, or uh, the rock that was trying to protect its, its babies and it was a silicon life form. The fact that they were actually breathing and talking to the silicon life form would have actually probably hydrolyzed the silicon life form. So it was incompatible with carbon life. Uh, anyway, Star Trek, um, going all the way back to the 60s. Uh, so if we look here, right, we form the silane. So that's the protecting group, deprotecting. Um, we could just hit it really hard with acid and water, um, but there is a better reducing agent here that's much more of deprotection group that's much more selective. So here's our protecting, right? Acid and water can react with lots of things. Um, so we don't want to hit this with just acid and water. So what we do with this one is we react it with a salt. With the fluoride. So it's actually the fluoride that does the, the bulk of the reaction here. Uh, what we have is tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. So the tetrabutyl ammonium allows it to um, be organic soluble and the fluoride is our main reaction point here. So it's actually the fluoride that does the, um, the, the bulk of the reaction. And what we end up with is removal of that to get us back to our alcohol. So the way this would work is we can take our bromide and let me make sure I'm using the same one. Yeah. Okay. First thing we do is protect it, right? So we're going to use the trimethyl silyl chloride um, and our triethylamine. That now protects that group, right? So we've hidden it. It's not gonna react the way that it normally would. Okay, then we can form our Grignard. So we add magnesium and now that we don't have that proton over there, this is not gonna react with our Grignard. Then we can bring in our carbonyl, right? And our water in the second step. Because we're using the TMS and not just another silane, the water's not gonna uh, take off that group, but then this gives us our, you know, our two, group, two carbons there. So we've extended our carbon. And then we add our tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride to do our deprotection. Okay. So we can do um, um, protection, right, and deprotection. Protection re reactions, in this case, there's two steps of reactions and then deprotection. Questions about protection and deprotection reactions. All right, let's uh, look at reactions of alcohols. Let's start with uh, substitutions. So if we have, you know, a tertiary alcohol, 
and we react that with, you know, HCl. Right, we can do an SN1 type reaction and get substitution. So we're aware of that one. You know, if we took um, an alcohol, let's say we took an alcohol like this. Let's do it in two steps. So we know if we take first, we activate that with tosyl chloride. Um, pyridine, right, we can get the tosylate, and then if we react that with, you know, a sodium chloride in, you know, protic solvent, we can get the chloride, right? So we've seen both of these, so these are reviewed. It turns out that uh, the primary halide reaction is a little bit dif difficult. So for SN2 style reactions, there's a few other reagents that we can use. One is for primary alcohols uh, to form the chloride. And here we use HCl and zinc chloride, um, not in zinc chloride, with zinc chloride. Um, what this does is allow this primary reaction to occur uh, better, it does go through an SN2 process. Um, here, the OH reacts with the zinc. We see the lone pair here that comes in, reacts with that. We now have this species. this species and then the chloride can come in. React with that to give me my chloride. So that's one, this is a slightly new reagent mixture. And this does do an SN, SN2 process. Another one is uh, thiol chloride. We bring in SOCl2 and pyridine. We can form the chloride. The mechanism for this one remember, we have a hypervalent, so we get a reaction. This can come down and kick off one of the chlorides. And the pyridine picks up a protein, proton, not protein, protein, proton. Oh, wait, wait. I misdrew this right off the beginning. Thought there was something wrong. I put too many oxygens, sorry. So, and I still have too many oxygens. All right. So then we have the chloride here. Right now we've got a good leaving group. The extra chlorine, right, comes in. The chlorine that left comes in and does an SN2 type reaction. I think we're about out of time. And that gives us the chloride, right? So we now, oops, trying to go fast and making too many mistakes. 
So we get the chlorine plus SO2 plus pyridinium chloride. This is this is a pretty straightforward reaction and, and kind of nice. Notice what we're what we're ending up with. We're ending up with the product we want. SO2 is a gas, and this is a salt, which may which won't be soluble in our solvent if we pick our solvent right. So we could filter this reaction and really be just left with our products. Okay, so this is the thionyl chloride reaction. The other one, and I don't have time for the mechanism today, but I do want to go ahead and introduce it. We'll look at the mechanism on Monday, is the bromide version of this, which is PBR3. And we'll look at the mechanism. It's similar that the reaction of the oxygen to the phosphorus makes the phosphorus oxygen compound a good leaving group, and the bromide comes in and attacks and kicks that off. 